Well, thank you for joining us today on our program on current climate conditions and outlooks. And our host today is my colleague, uh, Wendy Kelly. She's our weather variability and ag resiliency specialist and regional extension program coordinator with the University of Wyoming. I'm gonna turn it over to Wendy to introduce um, the other presenters and to host the program today. Thank you, Caitlin. And thank you to everybody for joining us this afternoon. Um, today I have joining me uh, Tony Bergantino, who is the interim director for the Wyoming State Climate Office, as well as the Water Resource Data Management System, or WORDS. And Tony is based down in Laramie, and he will be, he'll start off um, presenting about current conditions throughout Wyoming. And then we'll transition to Jerry Swanson, who has joined us as well. And Jerry is with the National Weather Service based in Riverton. And she will provide us some overviews on outlooks and some forecasts um, for the, the coming kind of week and beyond. Um, and then we'll transition to my presentation, which will be more focused on the, the drought monitor, kind of touching on it just briefly because I know others will talk about it. And then I'll also talk about how you can submit reports to the US drought monitor um, and, and provide information into that system, as well as other information and resources that are available here in Wyoming. So without taking up, I don't want to take up too much time. I'm just going to go ahead and turn it over to Tony. Uh, Tony. Well, thank you, Wendy. Uh, as you said, I'm Tony Bergantino. I'm the acting director of the Water Resources Data System and State Climate Office. I'm also the director of the Wyoming Mesonet and state coordinator for Coco Raz, which is the community collaborative rain, hail, and snow network. And we are a depart part of the Department of Atmospheric Science at the University of Wyoming. So let's just get right into it. And this is the current drought depiction as of uh, this Tuesday. And it has improved slightly in the last two weeks with the snows that have fallen over much of the state in, the, in that time. Uh, first, let me explain a little here about what all these colors mean. And uh, Wendy will touch upon some of this a little bit later in hers. But there are four levels of drought in order from least to worst. Those are moderate or D1, severe or D2, uh, extreme or D3, and then exceptional or D4. Additionally, there is a fifth level that is called abnormally dry or D0. And this condition either precedes drought or is the last phase when coming out of a drought before getting to normal conditions. It's also a heads up condition to say we're not in drought, but it wouldn't take us much to, uh, to push us into it. So how are these levels de are determined that we see on the map here? And they're based on a number of indicators of which precipitation is just one. Uh, soil moisture and stream flow are two others that are used along with uh, many others. There's a, a variety of blends of several other indicators that are considered by the drought monitor author when finalizing a map depiction like this. And these indicators are looked at in terms of percentiles rather than a percent of average. And a percentile ranking tells you where a current value falls in relation to all the other observed values. So if a value is at say the 20th percentile, that would mean that 20% of the values observed were lower than that value. And another way of looking at it is if the current value is lower than 80% of all the other values. So if you're at the 50th percentile, that's right in the middle or median, which is not necessarily the average. And so as you can see in the table here, when a convergence of those indicators fall in the in the 21st to 30th percentile, you have a D0, and then the 11th to 20th, a D1, 6 to 10, D2, and the corresponding colors here, 3 to 5 is D3. And then when you're at the second or less percentile, you're in D4, that exceptional drought. And those are conditions we would expect to see only once about every 50 years or less on average. So with the, the snows that we have gotten, basin snowpack has finally started to improve. And you can see the difference just from the start of February to now. Uh, map was not looking too good here around the beginning of February, but we've uh, gotten a lot more green, which is within 10% uh, of the median uh, value. And some of them are actually above. We have three basins that are actually above that. Those are the, the, the Yellowstone, the Shoshone, and the Tongue. And several of the other basins are getting fairly close as well. You see 98%, 97% in there. 
And this shows the percentage of Wyoming that has been in each category of drought. That's the percentage in terms of area from 2020 to present on the top here, and then sort of narrow up the scale a little bit and show from 2020 to present down here on the bottom. And you can see that the current drought here is the most significant that we've been seeing since uh, the 2012, 2013 one. And this is the same set of, set of charts, but it's for Bighorn County. Uh, you can see here the, the D3 popping up and you can see it a little bit better down here in the, in the image below where you just look at one year. And this is the same set for Washakie County. The D3 of the current drought is covering a much larger percentage of the county than we saw in Bighorn. And as you can see down here, that area is continuing to expand. And then again, the same for Hot Springs. The level of D3 is uh, not as high in terms of percentage as it was in Washakie County, but it's still affecting almost 40% of the county. And like in Washakie County, it's, it's continuing to expand. And in all three counties, this is the first D3 that has been in each of those counties since that 2012-2013 uh, drought back here. We started the year of 2020 being just abnormally dry over here in the West and down here in the Southwest. And these conditions continued with some variations, a little bit of ebb and flow of the area that was affected for the next several months. And then a large chunk of the state went into abnormally dry. And uh, this is on June 9th of 2020. And we've got some moderate drought appearing down here in the Bear Basin and then up here in the North Central part of the state. And this moderate drought that appeared, uh, it actually appeared on the 19th of May. And that was the first D1 in the state in about a year. It was about that time back in 2019 that the last the moderate drought uh, disappeared. By the end of June, uh, the northeastern two thirds of the state uh, deteriorated to this moderate drought. And we've even got a little pocket of severe drought or D2 uh, starting to appear here in Johnson County. And that appeared on the 23rd of June. And that was the first moderate drought in Wyoming since the end of January of uh, 2019. Another month later, and the conditions had deteriorated even more. Uh, the D1 or the moderate drought uh, had expanded as had that little, little bit of severe drought that was in uh, Johnson County is uh, taking up quite a bit more area here now. And furthermore, we've had, uh, we had three pockets of D3 appear in, in the state as well and here in uh, Hot Springs and Washakie and a little bit into Johnson and then Natrona up into Southern Johnson and then Northern Johnson into Sheridan with a little bit going into uh, Eastern Bighorn County. And this was the first D3 in the state since the uh, 9th of October in 2018. And the extent of the overall drought conditions did not expand much in terms of area over the next month, but the categories worsened within that area uh, the D2 expanded some and the D3 moved into Fremont County, then here into Converse County, uh, the northern parts of uh, Carbon, Platte, and Albany counties here. And a few weeks later, this is the end of September, the D2 has uh, expanded across you know, most of the south here, especially in Sweetwater County and Albany counties. Large areas fell to D3 or the extreme drought conditions here, especially in the central part of the state with fingers extending east to Nebraska and then down south to the Colorado border here. And by the first week in November, we settled into this depiction here, which remained fairly similar in appearance for the, about the next two months. Uh, central Wyoming filled in completely with the D3 connecting to that uh, D3 that was up in Sheridan and Northern Johnson County up here. And additionally, you can see this uh, dark red area down here in central uh, Carbon County. And this is D4, or exceptional drought. And it made its appearance at the time of this map uh, on the 3rd of November. And this was the first D4 that had been in Wyoming since the 9th of April of 2013, as the 2012-2013 uh, the or drought started to wind down. And this just shows how the US drought monitor looked at the end of 2020, not too different from how much uh, you know, the extent and, and conditions at the end of the, at the, the previous slide. And once more showing you what the present map looks like. Uh, again, this is the map from Tuesday of this week. Now let's take a look at some of the factors that cause that rapid expansion and intensification of the drought, something we call a flash drought. Uh, so the, an analog to the, the flash flood. And we'll start with temperature. 
And it's not shown here, but April was well below normal across most of the state, except for down in the, in the extreme Southwest, which was about normal, a little above normal. But May here saw temperatures above more normal for much of the state, except for the Northeast corner here, which was about normal with a little bit uh, uh, below normal as far as temperatures. May, uh, June was below normal here in Teton, uh, Lincoln, Uinta counties. Uh, but well above normal in the, the eastern portion of the state, especially here east of the divide, uh, the Laramie Range, the Bighorn. Uh, but then a little bit west of that, it's still, it's still above normal temperatures. July was below normal and still here in the, in the west, uh, a little bit further than you were seeing in June. Uh, but some areas over here in the, uh, in the east were still above normal, uh, some scattered areas. But by and large, not too bad. August, well, August was the killer and that was well above normal across the entire state here. Temperatures three to four degrees or more above, above the normal. Uh, and that was, that was pretty much statewide. And for precipitation, uh, May had below normal precip across most of the state, except for up here in the Northwest corner and little areas down here in the Southeast. Uh, June saw a bit more precip compared to average, uh, especially here in the north and western areas, but uh, the plains out here were not good, uh, above normal temperatures and, and winds were a little bit above average as well. This continued into July, we're only a few small pockets here up in the northeast, a little bit over in uh, Teton County and down here in the, in the extreme south uh, east saw above normal precipitation. And August was uh, worse than July. Very few pockets up here in the Northeast having above normal precipitation. And remember too, that August was well above normal in terms of temperatures. So we have kind of a double whammy of the poor conditions that affected the state in August. Now moving to soil moisture. We started the year with pretty good soil moisture here for the Northeastern, well, basically the northeastern half of the state. Uh, and then for the southwestern half, we have this band here that's about the median and a little bit here in uh, Sweetwater up in the Sublette, uh, a little bit in Lincoln and Uinta counties that was uh, below the median. But by the 1st of July over here, the soils had dried considerably, especially down here in South Central, Southwest or Southeast Wyoming. Uh, this band here is uh, right about the median and then the north west corner was still above the above the 50 percentile for soil moisture. At the end of September though only a small portion of Teton County was at the median and the rest of the state especially the, down here in the southeast was uh, well above uh, well below normal actually. Uh, this here is down in the, the second percentile which is, is really dry and this area you see up here in uh, Teton County is one of the few areas that escaped uh, having any even abnormally dry on the drought monitor. And so that kind of coincides there. At the end of 2020, over half the state was in the second percentile or less, uh, which is this basic line here of real dark red. Uh, conditions were a little bit better the further you got north, but only somewhat. Uh, Everything from this red line down is in the 10th percentile or less in terms of soil moisture. Now this is the surface water supply index as of the 9th of February. Uh, now this only looks at current reservoir storage and projected runoff and stream flow. And only two of the basins are on the wet side here, the Belfouche and the Shoshone. And there's five of the basins that are in moderate or worse deficit, the Bighorn, the Wind, the Upper Green, the Bear, and then here the, the Sweetwater is in, in severe deficit. And take a look at the soil moisture here as of yesterday. It's improved slightly in the northern part of the state compared to the end of the year, but still not good. There's this little area up here in northern Park County that's at about the median. And you can see the southern half of the state is still in less than the second percentile. It's only until you get up along here that you get up above the 10th percentile in terms of soil moisture. And what we don't know is just how useful the current snows in the plains will be for replenishing that soil moisture. The ground right now is below freezing uh, the 20, 25 inches. Uh, the station at Sheridan, I believe, is at about 24 inches uh, of the frost depth this morning and some of the ones over here are in the, in the 20s as well. 
So not sure how much of that uh, moisture that's in the snow is actually going to get into the soil column before it gets lost to the atmosphere through uh, direct evaporation. And speaking of those snows, this shows the modeled snow water equivalent across the state. The, the snow water equivalent map I showed earlier showed basin percentages based upon the high elevation snow tells, uh, generally seven, eight, nine, ten thousand feet elevation. This uses modeled and remote sense data across all elevations and also takes into account uh, the snow water equivalent reported by observers such as those in the Coco Ross program and, and, and sim similar programs like that. The recent snows really did help out here in the, in the eastern plains, especially east of the Bighorns, east of the Laramies, and a little bit up here east of uh, Cody. And we've yet to hit our March and April snows. So depending upon whether those are a hit or a miss, this could continue to improve the way it has in the last oh, two weeks or so, or we could start losing ground again. So as always in Wyoming, we have to see what our late winter and early spring snows uh, will do for us. And with that, I'll conclude and thank you for your time as we get ready to switch to our next presenter, Jerry Swanson with the, uh, the National Weather Service in Riverton. So again, I'm Wendy Kelly, and as Caitlin said at the beginning, um, I actually wear two hats. I'm the Weather Variability and Ag Resiliency Specialist for the University of Wyoming Extension, as well as the USDA Northern Plains Climate Hubs Regional Extension Program Coordinator. So it's a mouthful. Um, what this means is I serve all of Wyoming, but I also serve five additional states in my capacity. So today I'm excited to be here, one, to have Tony as well as Jerry to join us um, and to hear about current conditions. And then we'll hear about the outlooks from uh, Jerry after this presentation. But with my presentation, I wanted to touch a little bit more about the US Drought Monitor and how it is created. And then I'll transition into how you can help um, kind of raise a flag for us of what's going on out on the ground, um, as well as some other information and uh, tools that are out there for you. So here's the drought monitor map on the left from last week. It's the February 9th map. And then on the right, February 16th. So um, this is the map that was released today. And I get asked pretty frequently, how are these maps created? Like who's providing input into these um, and who's kind of drawing them? And I, that's what I wanted to touch on a little bit in my presentation today. Um, Tony took a few minutes to explain to us about the percentiles and the his, historical context of what determines that, you know, none to D0, um, which is abnormally dry, and then D1 through D4, the actual drought categories for the drought map. So for these maps to be created, um, for here in Wyoming, we have a team that's called the Wyoming Condition Monitoring Team. And this has existed essentially informally for many years and at one point historically more formally. But in 2020, this team formed again around like, hey, what are the conditions? What, you know, let's ensure that we're getting the information from out on the ground. Um, and we were getting it, but we wanted to make sure people knew where to feed that information and, and, and to continue to do that. So on the screen, you can see a list of different organizations. It's I think 16 organizations that includes university, state, tribal, and federal agencies. And this group um, has a, a vision which is to ensure that conditions throughout Wyoming and their associated impacts are captured and communicated to the appropriate authorities. And when I say appropriate authorities, that is a wide ranging group, um, but it includes the US Drought Monitor in it. And the vision also includes to create an efficient and sustainable condition reporting network that gathers input from those in the field. So this um, group of individuals that represent the different organizations work really hard to try and collect information about the conditions throughout the state. And, and I'll pause and say that there's individuals kind of all over um, Wyoming, as well as just outside of Wyoming. So for example, National Weather Service Billings, um, they service part of Wyoming. And so they're involved in this team. Um, 
and myself, I'm based in Pinedale and I'm a part of this team. So we, on a weekly basis, um, kind of draft, review a bunch of data and Tony leads this effort. Um, we review a bunch of data and then make recommendations to the U.S. Drought Monitor authors on behalf of Wyoming of what the U.S. Drought Monitor might depict for that week. Now the Drought Monitor author might tweak it, um, the recommendation, they may not fully accept it, whether they say, hey, we think there's you know, worse degradation or maybe we've seen some improvements over here, et cetera. So that's kind of the, a very rough outline of how Wyoming provides input to the US Drought Monitor authors on developing the, the weekly map. So with that, on a weekly basis, myself as well as others look at the national Seymour drought reporting system and Seymour stands for condition monitoring observer reports and you see the Seymour at the at the top and again this is a national um, reporting system where you can go in and report impacts out on the ground into the system and it can be anything from crops and livestock and they also have wildlife uh, freshwater fish, the list goes on. And I think it's important to highlight that it says drought condition monitoring, but it's all conditions from severely dry um, all the way, and I, I cut it off here, but to severely wet as well. You go to this link, and I, and I created a bit.ly link to make it a little bit shorter, but you go to this link and you can fill out a form um, to, to tell us what the conditions are like. So today I went to the um, map and I was like, huh, I wonder who, who has reported um, this month. So February 2nd, and that was the first date I could put into the system. And then it went through March 2nd, which I know we're not quite there yet, but to give us one month, you can see um, what it is. So we have one report from February 2nd to now. It was for Hot Springs County reported severely dry. The individuals lived in the area for 10 to 20 years. They've seen it this way once, um, and that was in 2012. They also were able to provide a little bit more information saying that they believe it's severely dry um, based on the conditions they're seeing throughout Bighorn Basin and into Fremont County as well. They were also able to um, provide some of the impacts that they've observed, and this is through kind of a checkbox system. So crop production impacts included less water for irrigation, a livestock production impact was reduced pasture forage as well as feeding hay, um, et cetera. And the individual continued on by saying that there are some wildlife habitat impacts. So they've observed less food for wildlife, um, change in wetland, bog, swamp areas, and then for freshwater fish, there's less water and reduced stream flow. So just to give you an idea of what goes into this reporting system, some of it, it's just you check the box if it applies, um, but you can also type additional information. I wanna also highlight on here um, what the map looked like for 2019. So this, or excuse me, it starts November, 2019 through September of 2020. And this is a screenshot that I captured for another presentation I did in December, just to show um, how many different records had been contributed to the system throughout Wyoming. And I think what's important is that to be able to, to go to the system and submit reports, not only when things are good or poor, the dry, but also when things are good as well to help um, tell the story throughout Wyoming. So there's a few things I want to highlight about the Seymour system and tips and tricks. Um, the first is on web browsers. I've been told that folks, um, including myself, have, ha have had success using Firefox, so Mozilla, to complete the Seymour report. Um, but I've also heard that Internet Explorer um, folks have struggled to access and, and submit reports through Internet Explorer. So if you or somebody you know is trying to submit a report and having issues, the first question to ask is which Internet Explorer, or excuse me, which um, web browser are you using and consider using one of the alternatives that are out there. 
I also recommend the, to put it on your calendar to submit a report just once a month. So mark your calendar, just like we pay our bills, to say what are the conditions on the 15th of every month and to go in and log it, whether the conditions are great or they're poor. And, and to tell that story because I, what happens is we just report when things are not good, but then we don't see the full story of how they evolve. Um, so it helps to tell the story a little bit better. The last uh, tip or trick that I want to offer when it comes to the Seymour system, as well as submitting um, people who email me reports, um, conditions, as well as photos on a regular basis. And the challenge is individuals will send me a picture, a one picture of one place and one point in time, but I don't live where you live and I'm not familiar with that pasture. And it's the same thing for the individuals at the, um, at the National Drought Mitigation Center and the US Drought Monitor authors that we're not familiar with your area. And so having comparison photos showing how an area looks today, this past year on the 15th of June this year, compared to the 13th of June in a good year. And having those side-by-side -side comparisons are really helpful. And if you submit reports on a regular basis, they'll be in the system and it, and it helps us to draw upon that. Um, so I just wanna encourage you, whether if you're submitting it to the Seymour system or sending an email to myself or Tony or somebody else to provide comparison photos. So Tony mentioned uh, the Community Collaborative Rain, Hill and Snow Network, Coco Raws, and I just wanted to mention it again. Um, so this is the map for Wyoming of the active stations. So each blue kind of square is somebody who's registered to be a citizen um, scientist or volunteer to report precipitation, um, ideally on a daily basis or lack of. So those zeros are really important in the Cocoa Raz. Um, so you can see here kind of your general area of how many volunteers are out there. And if you, for example, live right here, we would love to have you volunteer um, and, and to help fill in those dots. This is uh, the map from Coco Raz from this morning of the individuals who had reported in the last 24 hour period. Kind of zooming in again, you can see for your area, you know, kind of reflect back on how many dots were in your county to how many had reported in the last 24 hours. So if you're not a volunteer, I encourage you to volunteer. If you're a volunteer and you didn't report, um, I encourage you to, to try and uh, report as frequently as possible. I know I miss days as well. Um, but try to get in there and report. And if you did report and your neighbor didn't, uh, reach out to them and, and encourage them to report as frequently as possible. Um, as Tony mentioned earlier, that information, the Cocoa Raz information is used for, by a lot of different people, including US drought monitor authors, but also looking at the snow water equivalent and other um, databases pull that Cocoa Raz data into them. So if you're interested in learning more about Coco Raz, I encourage you to go to the Coco Raz website, which is on the screen. And also feel free uh, to reach out to Tony directly. Again, he is the state coordinator for the Coco Raz program. And if you have questions or you know, for myself, feel free to reach out. I'm a volunteer. I'm happy to share what I've learned and, and how I kind of manage mine. Um, and Coco Raz has a lot of great um, training animations on their website. So if you have questions, if you're a volunteer and have questions, I encourage you to explore their training animations because they're a lot of fun to watch. So another tool I wanna highlight is the Grassland Production Forecast or GrassCast. This is a tool that forecasts what production um, might be like. And they, they start forecasting in May of each year. Um, and there's a set of three maps when they're forecasting. They're not forecasting right now, so there's only one map. But when they're forecasting, there's three maps and they're forecasting again that grassland production. It doesn't cover all of Wyoming, but it does cover uh, Washakie County and then um, some other areas, including a little bit of Hot Springs County and I think a little bit of Bighorn County as well. And I mentioned this tool um, is just one to have in your toolbox to help you make informed decisions as they start to uh, forecast the, the production for this coming season. 
Another resource I want to mention is the Managing Drought Risk on the Ranch, which you can find at this URL and you can download the guide. This is put out by the National Drought Mitigation Center um, and it's been a great resource for many and I encourage you if you're a producer or work with producers um, to, to share this resource with them. The next tool I want to highlight is the USDA um, disaster Assistance Recovery Tool. This tool can be found at the, the web link here on your screen. It's a five step, um, it takes five steps asking questions that you answer to determine whether or not you might qualify for a USDA um, disaster program and what information to have compiled before you go into your local service center or before you call them. So I, I find it to be a helpful tool as it relates to drought and wildfires, as well as other disasters. And um, the last resource I want to highlight here, it's actually two resources that I think are really important. The first is the Wyoming Department of Agriculture's Wyoming Ag Stress website. The link is at the top of your screen. This is a website that the Wyoming Department of Agriculture released last year in 2020 and provides a lot of resources um, in case you or somebody you know is experiencing stress and needs some support um, that you can go to and, and, and to learn more. The other website I wanna mention is the University of Wyoming Extension's Farm Stress website. And this um, website, you can see the URL at the bottom of the screen and this website includes a lot of uh, resources, additional resources as well, as well as identifying signs or symptoms of um, somebody might be experiencing due to stress. So both really important websites um, to share with others and, and to explore and be aware of. So here's my contact information. Um, feel free to reach out to my, myself. And I've also listed Dr. Danelle Peck who is the director for the USDA Northern Plains Climate Hub, who fully, fully funds my position um, through the University of Wyoming Extension. So that is it for me. Anyhow, so I'm Jerry Swanson um, here at the National Weather Service in Riverton. My official title is Hydro Meteorological Technician. Um, I've been here for uh, now going on three and a half years. Okay, great. So as I was saying before, um, just going to go through some of the, uh, the short term and the outlooks uh, for precipitation and temperature across the area. Um, so for the next seven days, we are um, looking for um, more snow. And you can see the blue area there in western Wyoming. Um, that's going to be where the bulk of the, of the snowfall is going to be. Uh, we do have a storm expected uh, in Friday. Um, night around midnight um, for about 12 hours and then a small break and then another uh, wave of precip and you can uh, moving in again on Saturday. So they're gonna have um, basically a, a good 36 hours of, of light to moderate snow across uh, across the Tetons, um, the Absarokas, um, even on the, the Wind River uh, Mountains should see some of that snow. Um, but yeah, for, so for the seven days, a lot of snow expected uh, for the West. So we're hoping that'll uh, maybe help uh, build up that snowpack a little bit more. Um, unfortunately, central and um, northern Wyoming not looking uh, to have too much snow. And then southeast, you can see, uh, once again, a little bit more snow down in that area um, uh, for the next seven days. Um, this is the current 8 to 14 day outlook. Uh, you can see on the left, the temperatures, the blue area is showing uh, probability of um, temperatures to be below normal um, for a good part of the, the western part of the state, uh, with the north, the eastern part being more of um, close to normal temperatures for the next 8 to 14. Um, the right-hand graph showing um, the precipitation chances for the 8, eight to 14 days looking at normal chances of precipitation across most of the state, meaning we're not gonna see, uh, hopefully the normal amounts um, as far as what, what climate looks at. Um, and then a little bit of below average there for that Northeastern and far Eastern part of, of Wyoming. Um, 
just that 30 to 40 percent um, chance of just some below normal precipitation for those areas. Um, uh, then this is the one month outlook. Uh, and this is actually for um, still for February. Um, and you can see still looking at those below normal temperatures for pretty much the whole state. And um, the right hand slide showing um, above normal precipitation uh, just for the month of February. Um, so the, the last couple of weeks, we should still see um, a little more um, precipitation, but not uh, it's not going to be overly great, just that 30 to 40 percentile. So not a super great um, above normal number for us. And then for our uh, three month outlook, and this is uh, February, March, April timeframe. Um, as far as temperatures, you can see the, the brown um, is showing mainly for above normal temperatures, and that's for the three month average um, for February, March, and April. Um, and then the, just the northern sector there being basically equal chances of normal, uh, normal temperatures. Um, the right hand slide pretty much showing the, almost the entire state um, for the three months. Um, to have equal chances for precipitation. And basically that's just telling us that the computer models um, can't decide if it's gonna be above or below normal. So they're giving us equal chances. Um, we could see above, we could see below, um, but there's just too many variables uh, for the three month window for them to, to, to go either direction um, for precipitation chances. Um, and then as far as hazards go, you can see we're in February, uh, kind of our winter storm uh, mode, high wind mode. Um, folks that live down Cheyenne um, and along the I-80 corridor are very familiar with that right now. Um, and we still can be into the, a little bit of the ice jam um, area. We get those warmer days. Um, and then of course the winter storm time, which is gonna go through April. Um, into March, we get into um, a little bit of that fire weather and that's just as the temperatures start increasing in. Um, stuff, but you can see right now, high winds and winter storm are the primary um, issues for us. Uh, so here, um, looking at um, more snow to come, February, March, and April really are the snowiest months on average um, in Wyoming. Um, this is showing, like I said, the 1991 uh, to 2020 period. Um, and you can see January definitely um, February, March. So we're really hoping that March and April um, come up and give us some, give us some of that snow because we, they are supposed to be our snowiest months. So we're, we're keeping our fingers crossed on that one. And then as far as any hazards, um, for the end of February, you can see basically Mar uh, February 25th to the 28th, that few days, um, there's just that real slight chance that this southwestern half of Wyoming could see some um, much below temperatures again. That's where we get those uh, temperatures down in the negative numbers. Um, but it's only a 20% chance or less. Um, and that's really the only um, weather risk we're looking at um, for the next, uh, the next month. It's just that one little period where we may see some um, below normal uh, below normal temperatures. Otherwise, there weren't any hazards as far as um, high snow or um, or any real big wind episodes um, for the for the short term. Um, and then we've all been, been talking about the drought and just warm, dry patterns. This is um, the January 24th um, release. And Probably one of the biggest reasons is here's the precipitation for 2020. And you can see Wyoming had its fifth driest um, year on record. Um, and this is back since 1895. So uh, quite a ways back. So this is why we're seeing all of those um, numbers on our um, on our drought monitors. And then you can see just the divisional ranks. This is just last year's numbers as well. Um, and you can see a lot of the much below average, below average, um, except for that little sliver of the Northwest uh, that was near average. Um, so this this right here is a big reason why we're seeing the, um, the drought. 
Um, and this is our web page and our, um, our 800 phone number. And we talked about, they talked about the Kokoras, but we also have a program called Cooperative Weather Observers. Um, and these are folks that are, um, they actually do observations on a daily basis. And we're always looking for observers. If anybody lives in the big piney uh, area, we're definitely looking for a, for a volunteer down there. Um, but that's another program um, as well. And you can, you can look at that online as well. But this is our, uh, our information, our phone number. So thank you very much uh, for listening. Great, thank you, Jerry. So Caitlin, at this point, I'd like to just open it up for any questions we might have. And I don't know if there's anybody there with you or, um, or if it's just yourself. I do see we have a number of other uh, people logged in, but just wanted to know if anybody joined yeah, you so in person. All of our participants are online. So if anybody would like to, and there's a few enough folks that anybody would like to ask a question, please feel free to unmute yourself and speak up. You can also use the chat if you're more comfortable with that. Thank you to all three of our presenters. I learned a lot and it was a really, very interesting presentation. Or even observations. Do folks have observations on the ground or things they've been seeing or conversations they've been having with other people? I'm always told to be silent long enough where it starts to become awkward. There you go. <laughs> Just letting it become awkward. I do hey, have you, one. The, oh, go this ahead. Is, this is Landis Benson. Yes. I'm, I'm actually not in the state. Um, I'm firsthand, having a firsthand um, look at a really weird weather because I'm in Tulsa, Oklahoma, trying to get to Texas and I can't get there because the roads are closed and they've got... 12 inches of snow in Texarkana, where I'm trying to get to. Mm. I just thought I'd pass that on that um, there's no drought going on right here, right now. <laughs> Landis, you ought to come home. It's really beautiful in Orland right now. <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> it's all backwards. But I know. Th thanks for that presentation. Uh, Janet sent me a, a text to say it was going on, and I'm really glad I joined. Thank you to the presenters. Great. Well, thanks for joining Landis and I hope you get to where you need to go safely. I, I have family in Oklahoma, so I've been being kept posted on the, the conditions and yeah, well, um, thanks, Wendy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm wondering if Lisa, if you have anything you want to share. I know you've been getting a lot of reports from producers. Um, Lisa Bowers with FSA here in Washington County. Put her on the spot, I guess. And if you're struggling to find your unmute button, um, if you put your cursor over the right kind of corner of your picture, if you can see your picture, you can do mute and unmute there. Or another place is at the bottom left part of the, the Zoom screen. So Lisa might have to step away. I do have a question for Tony, and, and this is a question that maybe Lisa would have as well. I know that individuals email me conditions out on the ground on a regular basis. And I send them on to you, Tony, as you know, um, along with the photos. And I'm curious as somebody who makes recommendations to the US Drought Monitor team, what type of written reports, you know, emails that come in, what, which ones or, or what makes one really helpful like versus one that's not as helpful to help you understand what's going on out on the ground? The more detail that's in the description of what's going on or the conditions that are being seen on the ground, the better it is. A lot of times I'll find a situation where the numbers are looking like they have this particular area is kind of on the edge between one category and another. And if someone sends in a comment and can describe some conditions and particular impacts or things that they're having to do or that they're seeing on the ground, sometimes that'll be enough to, to tip it one way or the other uh, when that's sent on to the, the drop monitor author. And they'll take that into consideration as, you know, as an impact that goes along with those numbers to reinforce that. So those descriptions, uh, like you said, the photos, Photos only tell that one uh, snapshot in time unless there's a comparison, but a, a description of things that you're seeing, things that are, are different or, 
or like I say, those impacts that you're, you're experiencing, uh, a lot of times will go uh, towards helping push that over to, the, uh, to another category of drought if we're right on the edge, just based on the numbers. Because the, the numbers can only tell us one thing, but that's really what they have to go on uh, you know, to keep this you know, consistent through time and space is, is that percentile comparison that they do when coming up with the categories. But like I say, when you're on the edge, those descriptions really help. Great, thanks, Tony. And and I turned off my camera just because I got a message saying my internet's unstable. Um, so I'm still here. I'm just having a little, a little bit of stability issues with the internet. Um, so I'll try this to see if it helps. Anybody else have any questions? I can ask one more question, um, Caitlin. I was, out of curiosity, this one question is for Jerry. Um, so Jerry, I'm familiar with the canal tool, which is the cold, I think it's cold advisory for livestock tool. Um, I can't remember exactly what it stands for, for newborn livestock. And it's a tool that is on the National Weather Service Cheyenne's um, website as well as the Billings website and I've looked around on the Riverton website and I haven't seen it. I'm wondering if you if your office has the canal tool as well and you're muted. Um, um, actually that's a good question. I am not familiar with us having it but I can definitely ask the question because um, we actually have a um, at least one rancher here in the office uh, so um, I'll have to ask that question and, and see if that might be something we can look into. Okay. Yeah, that would be great. I, it's something that I've um, used the Billings and the Cheyenne Canal tool. Um, they both appear different on their website. So it seems like it's an office by office. And I looked mm -hmm. for it on the Riverton website and I didn't see it. Um, but it, it seems like it could be a really useful tool as we start to head into um, calving season and thinking about the hazard outlook that you shared with us um, that, that folks might be interested in that type of information as well. So again, it's the canal tool, which is the cold weather advisory tool. Yeah. Yep. I'll definitely look into that um, and see if we can, uh, we can look in. Yep. I'll definitely look into that. It's a great idea because we definitely have a lot of cattle ranchers, even just around here. Um, in our area so that'd be a great tool i'll look into it thanks for the suggestion yeah thank you any other questions i'll just make a comment or a, a, a plea for uh, more coco Ross observers out there uh, that program really is able to fill in a lot of the gaps that we're not that we have you know with the, the cooperative observer program that the national weather service has the Co cocoa Ross really helps to augment that and fill in a lot of those gaps and a lot of the problems that we're having sometimes is getting uh you know precipitation amounts and knowing what's going on in some of these areas that are remote and the the prism group which uh, creates a lot of these uh interpolated maps of precipitation across the, uh, the country really is starting to use and has been for a while the Coco Ross data. So that is an excellent resource to get those zeros in terms of drought or the precipitation values that are coming there so that we get more accurate, more detailed interpolated maps to be able to look at areas in finer detail rather than just in a climate division as that we were restricted to you know, earlier on in the, in the drought monitor. Uh, that it really helps to be able to get that finer detail and draw those lines more accurately on the ground. Yeah, and to add on to what um, what Tony said is we'll we'll put out a graphic showing snow amounts for locations for towns, and then on our like on our social media we'll get responses back. What do you mean only you know half inch is shown? You I had five inches, but if we don't get reports from those people, we can't put them into our reports that go into the system either. So um, so anytime I have someone that says, well, I got more snow than that, it's like, well, hey, become a Kokora or hey, become a spotter. Um, so that's exactly, it, it helps us as well 
Um, and there are people out there that complain because their city or town isn't represented. And that's the reason. Um, so we always invite them to, to join, join us, become a Kokora. So definitely a, a great, uh, a great topic. <laughs> Absolutely. We know how variable precipitation is across the landscape. I always just think about driving down the road and one minute it's sprinkling on my windshield and the next second it's not and then it is again. So it's just it's so variable and the more reports we can get into the systems, it helps everybody who is um, trying to put out the, the forecast as well as looking at the drought monitor, etc. So it's really valuable data um, and all of us have a role that we can play in that. Um, Caitlin, I see we have two more minutes. So if anybody has another question, feel free to unmute yourself. Um, I see Peggy, you're unmuted. I don't know if you might have a question. Might have been an accidental unmute. Um, so Peggy, if you can hear us, oh, there you are, you're muted again. Um, the, the other thing I want to ask uh, in the last two minutes is if there is types of information or resources related to drought that you or individuals you work with are looking for and maybe can't find, um, that would be really helpful for myself to know as well as Tony and Caitlin and others um, and Extension and, and other service providers just to know what type of drought information or conditions information that you're looking for and might be having a hard time finding. So I'll just, for the last minute, open it up to that, or feel free to send me an email if you think of something after today's presentation. All right, we have a quiet group and that's okay. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a question to con, con, continue to contemplate. And again, send me an email if you think of something or, or let Caitlin know and she can let me know as well. Um, so I wanna thank everybody for their time again today and, and for joining us. And feel free to reach out at any point to Tony, myself, or Jerry in the National Weather Service there in Riverton and Caitlin. Thank you, Caitlin, for having us. Thank you very much to all of our speakers and um, everyone have a lovely afternoon.